quick introduction about Dr. Swaminathan. Um, a pediatrician from India, Dr. Swaminathan is a globally recognized researcher on TB and HIV and currently the chief scientist at the WHO. She has over three decades of experience in clinical care and research. Dr. Swaminathan has served as Secretary of the Department of Health Research and Director General of the Indian Council of Medical Research and has published over 250 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. In this chat, Dr. Swaminathan will share her perspectives on tackling the spread of COVID amongst India's poorest and the measures the government could be taking to protect the most vulnerable. I'm looking forward to hear her speak on the various aspects of public health care systems in India, our current readiness and vulnerabilities and what must be done to build enduring resilience. Dr. Swaminathan, uh, honored to have you join us and over to you for the next 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, greetings to everyone who's uh, listening in. Um, I think this is a great uh, initiative, first of all, to get different points of view, ideas and thoughts, especially on our Independence Day, as we celebrate 74 years of uh, independence. And then we're looking ahead to a bright future. I think it's time really for you know, the generation that we belong to, which is uh, the post-independence generation who were born in free and independent India and had the benefits of growing up in a democracy with um, uh, freedom to speak and act and, and, and a good education. Um, we also need to give something back. And I think as people who have, uh, at least for, I speak for myself, um, sharing our experiences and thoughts is, is probably a constructive uh, contribution. Now, of course, we're living in this pandemic and everything is colored with uh, the pandemic. And so it's really hard to think about uh, uh, anything because it's affected every aspect of life. Uh, now, today, of course, we're focusing on public health. And I think one thing that this pandemic has done has completely brought to the center the importance of public health. And I think it's been, maybe that's been the only silver lining that it has forced governments, political leaders and the public to appreciate the key role played by both science and by public health. And we've also seen that those countries which have invested in the past on public health, on universal health coverage, on good surveillance systems, on good primary health care, were able to do better. And of course, there are many different pillars when you talk about uh, public health. There are pillars starting from the governance, how the cadre is set up and managed, so the, the whole management side of it, then the financing, you know, how much of the services are free at the point of care, how much is the out-of-pocket expenses that people are facing, what are the supply chain and the logistics, the data systems, and very importantly, the human resources, the cadre of health professionals, starting from the village health workers, the volunteers like the ashas in India, for example, the nurses, the doctors, and all the other functionaries we should not forget. We often think about doctors and nurses automatically, but we forget that you need lab technicians, you need physiotherapists, you need counselors uh, and mental health specialists. You need a host of people managing the pharmacy, for example, pharmacists. So you need a host of paramedical staff to really be able to work as a team and deliver quality care. So again, the focus over the last few years has shifted from quantity to quality of services. And we've been expanding the package of essential health services. Um, countries which are investing heavily in universal health coverage are expanding uh, the package of services. Now, we often talk about uh, protection or health security being the other side of the coin as universal health coverage. So UHC and health security actually 
go together because the investments that you make in the system actually serve both. And it's clear that for health security, you need an investment in, in advance. And one of the things again that's come to the fore is that while there have been major, many, many uh, warnings about pandemics in the past, and of course, the world has seen you know, previous pandemics, of course, all due to influenza, most countries didn't take this uh, warnings very seriously um, till it's actually happened. But at least this gives an opportunity for us to build back stronger and, and better. I think India has done well in managing the, the pandemic so far, but the challenges are huge because of the, the population, the diversity, the heterogeneity of the health systems, the capacity of the health systems in different parts of the world, the type of populations, the overcrowding in the cities and the, and the lack of access to healthcare in many rural areas, all of these pose, uh, pose challenges. And therefore, uh, I think whatever we do has to be innovative. It has to be flexible. It has to be based on science and data and, and evidence and yet allow enough local uh, flexibility to be able to adapt to the local context. And, and the circumstances. And one of the things that I know that India is planning to invest in heavily is data systems and has been doing. Uh, you have the unique identification for each individual, the electronic health records, the plans for a national health staff, the National Health Assurance uh, Authority, which is also uh, working mostly digitally so all of this actually is helping to build the backbone of a digital infrastructure, which would be really needed uh, for the future of uh, healthcare. And again, I think the pandemic has forced us to be quite innovative in the, in the ways in which we uh, communicate and conduct our day-to-day -day business. And so it's giving us a lot of insights into how we can leverage technology. So, uh, while I have been visiting some hospitals, while I have been here in, uh, in India for the last few days, I was struck by the fact that people are really finding it very difficult to, to come to health facilities now because of lockdowns in a number of places, lack of public transportation and the fear of going into hospitals. And so this is an opportunity really to invest heavily in telemedicine and, and use telemedicine in, in many different ways. One is a classical patient to doctor consultation. You do it on tele instead of doing it in person. But this could also be leveraged to, to do training and to do shared virtual appointments. So for example, if there is a chronic disease clinic, which people are not able to access, people with hypertension or diabetes or heart disease who are on treatment and normally would come to the hospital every month or every three months for a checkup, it should be possible now to engage them, not only one-to-one, -one, because that of course requires the same amount of time the doctor would provide for an in-person, but a, a shared appointment where you could have 10 or 20 people with diabetes joining in um, a session with a doctor, a specialist. And while he, talks, he or she talks to one patient, the others are actually listening and to the questions and answers and thereby also learning. And this has worked actually in, in several places. These experiments have been done to show that shared care actually perhaps in some ways offers advantages to individual one-to-one, -one, except in cases, of course, where there's confidentiality issues and people may not like to reveal their status. But for many diseases, people don't mind actually uh, discussing with others. And it's, a, it's an opportunity to learn from how others are doing also from your peers. And so I think innovations like that in the health system and also being able to support and communicate with our frontline workers, whether they are ASHAs or VHNs or ANMs, to improve their performance, they need constant feedback. They need that loop which tells them what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. And that could be somebody based either at the primary health center or at the district hospital who, who, who does this. And again, it could be uh, a shared uh, platform where instead of the in-person meeting, they all 
I think building up as outlined in the National Health Policy 2017 is going to be very important and uh, very few states in India today have that. And that is critical because it provides you again a structure in order which you can be activated. It's of course doing its routine activities, but in the case of an outbreak, an epidemic, it can be promptly activated in order to provide a number of different services. Having trained field epidemiolog epidemiologists who know how to do outbreak investigation, who can not only detect an outbreak, but also investigate it and put in place a response. So detection, prevention, and response are the three uh, pillars which form part of the international health regulations that all countries have signed up to and uh, which sort of guide the way in which we would strengthen uh, the performance in, in that area. And, and again, I think this is a time to take a critical self look at what we have done well, what are the gaps and what we could do better. I mean, I think an incredible um, success story has been the fact that from no indigenous testing reagents and one lab that was able to do testing for COVID in, in, the, in January, we now have, uh, I think, 1,500 or more labs across the country and that most of the reagents are being indigenously manufactured. So it's possible when there's a challenge, we can also take it as an opportunity. But it needs a very holistic uh, approach. A piecemeal uh, approach is not going to work. And, and perhaps the last thing that um, uh, point that I would like to uh, speak about is the participation of communities and people. And uh, I was very impressed when I went to Thailand to see their primary healthcare system and how the community really actively participates in uh, providing feedback, in being very close to the local sub-center or the primary healthcare center, and also having gatherings, like they have this uh, People's Health Assembly every year, which is, starts from the local level, at the village, at the district level, and then goes all the way up to a huge National People's Health Assembly every year where ordinary citizens come together to discuss their health problems and the solutions with staff from the uh, Ministry of Health and also with, uh, with other political leaders like the elected representatives. So I think that's another area where we could strengthen and which would really help our primary health care system if we started involving the community, getting the feedback, be, having them participate in programs. Because for many diseases, we know that having a curative approach is, has limitations, especially the chronic diseases. We talk about non-communicable diseases. There's a limit to how much diagnosis and prevention you can do. It's like not turning off the tap, but you know, only trying to, to control the level in the bucket without, uh, when you have a, a constant tap that's open and filling the bucket. So this is where prevention and uh, risk factors and the other social determinants environmental determinants, social determinants, economic determinants of health, they come into play. And that needs, again, a separate approach. And it's, again, this becomes an all-of-government approach where the health ministry or the health department actually become the stewards and the champions. But the actual implementation may be done by different ministries, whether it's road transport for road safety, whether it's the food and agriculture department for, for nutritious food, whether it is the women and child department who manages the schools uh, and health and education need to, to go together. So whether it's the finance department, which actually uh, makes the taxes happen, taxes on tobacco, taxes on alcohol, taxes on unhealthy foods. So on the one hand, we have to strengthen our healthcare delivery system, including the human resources and, and develop the public health cadre. And on the other hand, it's what individuals, behavior change uh, can do and at the community level at the village level or at the urban uh, neighborhood level, what are the things that they can put in place, including water and sanitation and waste disposal and taking care of local water bodies and, and trying to reduce pollution. So that I feel would be the holistic approach as uh, we look forward to new era and uh, not only more financial investments, but more investments in health leading to a healthier population. 
for all Indians. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Swaminathan, for your rich and timely insights, uh, which is also a great segue for our next segment. Thank you so much, Dr. Swaminathan.